So uh, what are we talking about tonight? Let me give you a, a bit of a, a, an overview or the agenda for tonight. The theme for tonight is reconnect, reconnecting, reconnecting to one another, reconnecting to the Lord, reconnecting to the church. Um, I think a lot of us feel viscerally disconnected, um, maybe in all of those categories, um, maybe some more than others, but that's really what we want to talk about. And kind of cast a vision for reconnection to one another um, as the body of Christ. So we're going to open in prayer. Then I'm going to, I'll lead the time off with, with just an overview of reconnecting to our vision. What is it, what does it mean to be the church during uh, a pandemic, during this time? Just some reminders, some encouragement I want to give you guys for right now. Then we're going to hear from Trip uh, about the plan for worship uh, for the next season, the next six months or so. We'll hear from David about reconnecting in community uh, through uh, through various means. And then we'll hear from Courtney, uh, reconnecting to family discipleship. Then I'm going to round out the time with some community announcements, uh, just some stuff that we think is good for people to know uh, that normally you would find out just by word of mouth or being present on a Sunday morning. Uh, but some stuff we think would be good for you guys to know. Then we'll go into the Q&A time. Um, and I said for people who have come in in the last few minutes, originally we were going to have people ask your questions, but I was advised by someone who's done a lot of these meetings that that can be chaos because 10 people can try to ask a question at once. So um, there you go. Thank you, Michelle. So if you look in the text, uh, the chat, section. There's a little button at the top of the screen that looks like a box with text in it. Click on that. Uh, so there's a there's a number there. Uh, you can text your questions for the Q&A. You can text them during the vision night or you can text them during the Q&A. And those questions can be about anything we talk about in the vision night. They can be questions for the ministry leaders, the staff, the elders. Um, you know, this is, this is, again, we haven't gotten to see each other in a while, so this is a time to be able to, to ask questions and talk together, and then we'll close in prayer. Lee, I think I'm going to ask you to close in prayer, so heads up for that. All right. Any, any questions now from anybody before we, before we jump in? All right. Thanks, everybody. Let me pray. Our Father and our God, we, uh, we love you and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the reminder that um, your church has been through incredible seasons of suffering, incredible seasons of victory and peace um, over the last 2,000 years and before that, the people of Israel for thousands of years. And so, Lord, we are in... Uh, an unusual, confusing, difficult time, and yet you are with us. And so we pray, Lord, that you would lift up your name during this meeting. You would lift it up in what we hear, but in our hearts, more importantly. We pray, Lord, that this really would be an opportunity for us to reconnect with one another, even though we're just looking at little pictures of one another on a screen. Lord, our hearts need reconnection. Um, and so, Lord, I pray, do your work, Holy Spirit, um, in your church uh, during this time. Bless Village Church and bless our communities through your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, so reconnecting to our, our vision. Um, it's become, a, it's, it's, it's almost lame to say, uh, these have been a these have been a hard seven months, <laughs> right? Um, this has been unprecedented. This has been difficult. It's been confusing and frustrating for all of us. There's been so much unknown, um, so much uncertainty, and it has set nations, it set companies and churches and individuals sort of on our heads, and so. Um, I know I've heard many stories from people in our church, and I know my own story <laughs> that that this has been a hard time. And 
um, in my own life and in the life of the church, uh, I see two things happening. And again, I've heard this from lots of people in our church saying it to me, like this has been a, a time uh, that you could say the Lord is leading us as a shepherd through the valley of the shadow of death. There's, there's a lot of um, pain and frustration, fear. And yet at the same time, there's been a lot of blessing, unexpected blessing where the, the Lord has worked uh, often through that suffering and through that turmoil, but, but also in just strange ways, right? More time alone, more time with him, uh, less busyness, those types of things. Although, you know, now once August and September and now October hit, seems like the busyness um, is going up uh, again. And, and like I said, this has been difficult for me and for my family. There's been seasons of real uh, sadness and real, um, I would almost say seasons of depression where you just don't want to get out of bed in the morning and you wonder, is anything I'm doing or we're doing making any difference? Um, we don't know what to do. Uh, it's been hard for Stacy. I won't speak for her, but she's not real secretive. <laughs> this is, she, I thought we were both extroverts, but she, um, there she is. We, the pandemic has shown that I'm an, I'm an extrovert maybe down here and she's an extrovert up here. And so the, the feeling of relational disconnect for her has been um, really excruciating. And it's been something we've had to walk through uh, together. And it's been hard. And it, I know people in our church who have had loved ones who have died, who've been in the hospital and you couldn't see them. You couldn't go to the hospital. It's incredibly cruel. Um, my parents' 50th wedding anniversary was uh, in March. And it was the week we were going to celebrate it on March 21st. And that was the week that everything kind of shut down. And so uh, they were going to recommit their vows. And, you know, we had plans and it was really sweet. And uh, we weren't able to do it till August. And thank God we were able to do it. But, you know, ways in which all of our families are sort of affected, um, disrupted. My family is quarantined twice. I think I've, I've said this in a sermon or in different places where, you know, you're just going about your business and out of nowhere, you get a text that someone you are with either has the coronavirus or may have the coronavirus. And literally from one second to the next, your, your next 14 days just change. And it just makes life feel unstable and unsettled. Um, and early on as a staff and as leaders, we were scrambling to figure out what to do. And um, for those who, you know, were tuning in with the live feed, you know, those first, I want to say even two months, I mean, it was a, it was a number of weeks. We were live streaming through my phone, <laughs> you know, we were uh, just setting up a phone on a tripod and we were recording through the microphone. I mean, that was, that was not a fun season. Um, and then we, spent thousands of dollars on cameras and new te new computers and new, you know, we, we went through a major technology shift. Um, and, you know, and, and a lot of stuff that was going on behind the scenes that, uh, that people couldn't see and people didn't know about. And, and frankly, things that have come up over the summer is we've realized we've, we've missed some things and we haven't done uh, some things very well. And two of the main things is, communication. We've learned that uh, we did not, we do not, and we did not have a good system of communication for, for a church that's not meeting in person. Um, and really some of our communication patterns reflect, you know, the small church that we've been and doesn't reflect the larger church that we're becoming. And so I know a lot of people missed communication over, over the summer. And that was really frustrating. And uh, as we've gotten feedback about that, we're really we we um, we're really sad and frustrated about that. And we are taking uh, real steps to put together a better communication plan moving forward. Um, the other thing we think we've we uh, didn't do very well was a systematic shepherding. Um, sort of when everything went chaotic. Um, 
me and the elders and some of the staff, we would reach out sort of piecemeal and sort of re we were reacting. But because of changes to the, uh, to the elders and our work with moving front to a parish system, which we talked some about late last year and early this year, we really dropped the ball with systematic shepherding. And we know that some of our people, some of you, uh, did not get reached out to by the church for months and months. And that was a real fail on our part. And so if, if you experienced that, if you were frustrated about that, if you just recognized it and were cu curious about that, just know that we are sorry and that we, um, beginning in July and, and then in August, we have implemented a new systematic uh, shepherding um, approach. And so uh, everyone in the church on a regular basis should be getting a touch from an elder or a staff person we're um, in order to do this well and with the low number of elders we have right now um, we, we've asked the staff to help out but everyone has the opportunity they have access to an elder even if even if a staff person but what i want you to hear me say now is i know that that was a miss and that was something that got lost in the shuffle during the summer and, and we're really sorry about that and we're ready to do better um, but as we were scrambling and as we as things settled, um, I began and we began to reconnect and remember the mission of the church. And what occurred to me is that um, who we are has not changed, right? We are the church. We are God's people. We are God's children in this place. And though the world has changed around us, who we are has not changed and God's mission hasn't changed. Um, what has changed is how we do that. You <laughs> know, in, in some ways, everything about our lives have changed. Um, but I want us to be encouraged that God still wants to, and he never, he never stopped. He wants to continue to reflect his glory and, and reveal himself to the world through us during this time. Um, so I want to I want to briefly right now touch on the five areas of ministry that we talked about back in January and the framework we're using to for us to understand what's the what is the ministry of our church? Why are we here? And it's it's both for us corporately, but but these elements um, are true for every one of us individually. So I, I want to walk through them briefly and just talk about how we can continue to be the church during quarantine and, and during this pandemic. Um, and I, I just want to challenge us. And I know as I say that, what I what I suspect some of you would are thinking or feeling is, man, I'm I'm so tired. I'm still frazzled. My kids are still doing virtual school. Like, please don't give me more to do. And what, what I want to encourage you to do is what I'm about to say is is not to add tasks to your list but to remind you that these are the areas in which God is and wants to work in and through all of us right where you are. So if you're exhausted, God wants to work through your exhaustion. If you're scared, God wants to work through your fear and, and uh, address your fear in, in any of those categories. So let me just hit on these real quick. So worship, there are the five areas, worship, connect, grow, serve and share so worship uh let's just let's just be honest about this nobody likes virtual worship does anybody like virtual worship no i don't see any hands i mean I don't I like there are some people what trip i don't like virtual worship exactly um nobody likes virtual worship i you know obviously i'm in the sanctuary most sundays but there have been a couple instances where i have engaged in virtual worship through other ministries. And guess what? It was terrible. Like, I don't like it. Um, I was listening to this guy preach the gospel and I was like, get to the point already. Um, it's hard to listen to sermons. It's hard to stay engaged when you're looking at a screen, when you could just, you could just walk off, you could walk out of the room and nobody knows. Um, so let's just acknowledge and say virtual worship is hard, no matter how well you do it. And there are better ways and worse ways, but we need to acknowledge um, that fact. But what we've noticed and we've heard from our church and different churches is that over time, 
engagement or presence in Sunday worship is going down. And so I want to take this opportunity to call us to endurance. Um, I wish there was something else we could do. We researched meeting in Brownwood Park or a public park for worship or meeting in somebody's parking lot. And none of those things we were able to work out. And so for right now, this is what God has given us. And it reminds me, I, th I think I mentioned this in a service a few weeks ago. This, this circumstance we're in reminds me of Israel in the wilderness, um, right? God in Exodus, he leads them out of Egypt. He saves them through miracles and through the crossing of the Red Sea. And then they're in the desert. They have nothing to eat. They have no way of of uh, feeding themselves. And so what does God do? He miraculously creates bread from heaven, right? Manna. They walk out of their tents in the morning and there is food on the ground that they can gather and they can eat and they are sustained. And it is a miracle. And at first they are ecstatic. They're amazed. God is literally uh, sustaining us through miraculous provision. Well, guess what happens like just a couple weeks later? <laughs> they get up in the morning and they say, I can't believe we're eating the same bread again. This bread is so old. I'm so, I'm so over it. And, you know, there's the whole thing where they, you know, God's like, you want meat? Well, here's some quails. You're going to have some meat coming out your nose. Um, but the point is, is it was still a miracle. And it was through that bread that God sustained his people in the wilderness for 40 years. And so what I, I want to call us to endurance and say, I wish we could. And I mean, in-person worship did begin last Sunday and it was awesome and it was exciting and, and that's going to continue. But I wish we could go back to the way things were. And I know that it's hard, but this is what God has given us in virtual worship. And so I, I want to challenge us. If you have if you have questions, if you have ideas, if you have frustrations about virtual worship, I want to hear them. Your elder wants to hear them. Trip wants to hear them. But even when it's hard, we want to call you to worship. You're going to hear from Courtney in a few minutes about we're, we're trying to find every way possible to help individuals and to help families make Sunday morning as engaging as possible. And almost every week, if you're watching, we, there are little tweaks and changes along the way. So we're, we're open to feedback, but um, we, what I don't want is for our people to walk away from God's provision of sustenance in this time. And, and let me put a finer point on it. I don't think it's, it's not adequate and it's not equal to just download or podcast the sermon. There's something about gathering together at the same time if possible, worshiping the Lord together in song and in prayer and scripture reading. Your soul was built for that. It needs that. And so I want to challenge you to come back to that and avail yourself of, of things to make it easier. Again, house groups, you know, groups of, of people who are still socially distancing, but, but worshiping together in one another's presence. All right, let me keep moving for the sake of time. Connect. We are the body of Christ and we're meant to be connected both spiritually and physically. And again, it's hard right now, but we need this. And so, um, and God will sustain us through this difficult time. So do whatever you can not to be cut off from others. Again, whether it's a house group or a men's or a women's group, um, whatever you need to do, come to you know register for in-person worship. If you need help connecting to a group, Email David Stancil. He would love to help connect you with others uh, any way that he can. Grow. This is a time I've heard from many people, my own personal experience. It's easy when you're tired and fatigued and frustrated with the world to let your spiritual disciplines and your spiritual life uh, slack off and slide. And um, the irony is, even though that's the easiest thing to do right now, it is a, it's a recipe for disaster, right? Now is a time when we most need um, to be growing in our spiritual faith and our life, our relationship with the Lord. And so, say, you know, there is an enemy. This is not just your own flesh. There is someone out there who wants to convince you like, oh, I'm just, I'm just going to coast until we get back to the way things were. 
And then months pass and we wonder why we feel disconnected from God and one another and are frustrated. So again, I want us to relate to one another and say, this is hard for all of us. And yet I want to call us up and say, together, we need to commit to one another that we are, um, we will continue to grow in our faith and seek the Lord. And uh, David Stansel has been putting together curriculum for the house groups that I believe that began to go out today. Um, if you need resources, if you need help with devotionals, just in your own relationship with the Lord, or again, you want to be connected with others to help uh, your spiritual growth, reach out to us and we want to help you in that process. Uh, serve. It's hard to serve in the church right now. It's hard to know where to serve because we usually serve with other people, uh, but there are opportunities inside and outside the church. We've just started in-person worship. We need, we need uh, hospitality volunteers who are willing to come in and take people's temperature and, and set out the little communion packets and you know all that kind of stuff. We, we need volunteers there. Tripp's going to talk about uh, worship volunteers, liturgists, vocalists, that kind of stuff. There are, there are areas in the church where we can serve. But obviously, there are, there are places to serve all around us. And honestly, when I talk to people, um, our people are serving, serving family members, serving neighbors in need, uh, and serving in the church. But just remember that service is an aspect of who you are and who we are as God's people. So now let's not let it go. Finally, we can share the gospel during this time. You can invite your neighbors uh, to a house group. You can invite your neighbors to worship. Um, you can show them that you that you do those things. Talk about the fact that you go to church. Um, in this time, you know, dur especially during the pandemic, uh, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of racial tension in our world. And I don't even need to mention much about our toxic uh, political season going on right now. It's the testimony of the gospel that we show that we have hope even while we fully admit and acknowledge the, the state of the world, <laughs> you know, and that we have reason to, you know, there are things tempting us to fear. Um, but when we show that we have hope and that we have a place to go in, in those temptations, we, we draw people, we give people an opportunity to see the hope that we have within us that comes from the Lord. Um, so I just want to call us for you to remember that, that you are a vessel, you are an ambassador of the gospel wherever you go. You have a purpose and God's Holy Spirit is in you and at work in every conversation. And guess what? You admitting your fatigue, it doesn't mean you have to have a happy face all the time. That honest communication, that reaching out and caring for people around you is a way of inviting people and sharing the gospel um, with the people around you. Again, I was reminded of the biblical example of uh, the widow with the two pennies and the small child with the three loaves of bread and the two fish. You know, those stories are meant to tell us if we if we're on empty and we bring our empty to Jesus, guess what? He takes that empty and he's able to multiply it and serve the multitude. So this isn't this isn't something about gearing yourself up or hyping yourself up. This is simply availing yourself and being willing to be used by God wherever you go. Um, and especially in such a time as this, when our world is upside down, brothers and sisters, you are lights. You are lights. You shine. You radiate the gospel wherever you go because of the Holy Spirit in you. So I just call you to remember that and to reconnect your heart with that calling and that reality tonight and tomorrow and and as we as we go throughout this pandemic. So that is my that's that's what that's all I have to say. I want to re reconnect us to that vision that you have a vital part to play and our church in this community has a part to play even and especially right now. So, I'm going to hand things over to Trip for his uh, portion talking about worship. You ready Trip? I think I'm as ready as I will be. Um, so I'll be honest, guys. Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. Um, I'll be honest. I was actually really, really nervous and anxious to go first. But uh, Matt, I don't think you could have teed that up better. 
So everything that we're talking about tonight, whether it's worship, whether it's children's and family ministry, whether it's um, our parishes, anything, uh, it really, we're trying to pull out of this, this framework of reconnecting and I, it's this this tendency of, and, and I know it's, I don't think COVID is a sentient thing that's trying to pull us apart, but um, it is a challenge of the church. And I think it's the, the work of the devil to use these kind of things to try to pull us apart. And we have to consciously work against that to come together and to unify. And so thank you, Matt, for for opening. And it's, it's an honor, again, to be a part of this. I know I probably talk y'all's ears off every time I say, how just continually amazed and blessed Hannah and I are to have found this community in Atlanta and I uh, just continually blown away and humbled by y'all. So thank you. Um, I am talking about our vision. Matt said, uh, Matt said over the next six months or so, I was actually queued up to talk worship 2020 through 2025. Um, and I will, uh, but I do want to, I do want to emphasize things that are part of the bigger plan, the 20,000 foot view and the, lower like the more immediate things that are where we really need to focus right now um so working out of reconnect and now i'm kind of just feeling it out because i've got my notes here on the side and i'm also talking to you guys um so our vision let me start there so our vision of village church is i'm assuming we've all read at some point our vision we've had these vision nights before hannah and i came our you can't see her she's right here Hannah and i came our first time uh, we came on a Sunday where y'all happened to be doing a vision night later that evening. And the first thing that y'all talked about was the vision, um, just as a refresher. So we're all on the same page. Our vision at Village Church, Village Church of East Atlanta exists to be a biblical community in, of, and for our East Atlanta neighborhoods so that people may come to know, celebrate, and follow Jesus Christ as the only hope for the brokenness in us and around us. And I think this is to the point and sincere. And it's one of the things, like I said, that drew Hannah and I to Village Church a year ago. Uh, and I'd like to build on it. Um, it's very important to me that we focus our worship department as we intend to grow it. So I would like to create a mission statement specifically for our worship ministry. And this is me kind of throwing out the basic idea. If you guys want me to send you notes or a follow-up or an actual intact thing, um, I'm sure we'll talk it out more at length as staff and elders and things like that. But I wanted you guys to get a feel for where I want to direct us. Um, to accomplish this vision, our Village Church worship ministry will aim to create and facilitate a culture of sincerity where anyone in the East Atlanta community is welcome to encounter God's presence, find emotional and spiritual restoration, commune with God in the church family, and learn to worship wholeheartedly in any context or circumstance of life so that we all may be changed for the glory of God. And that's a lot of nice words, but I mean every word I say there. And that's going to frame everything that I want to talk about tonight. That being said, and you may have heard that, and you said, wow, that really sounds really nice, but... I would say, so why do we do that? What is our, as a church, what is our why? What is our why globally as the church, as the big letter, big C Catholic church, as the lower C, universal church, or as the small C church in East Atlanta Village and elsewhere? Why do we do anything that we do? And that's actually, I, I say it as a rhetorical question, but, um, and I know we're trying to uh, sway against people chiming in, but I do want to ask if anyone wants to pop in and say, why? Why do we do what we do? Anybody, it's okay. All right, you guys have great etiquette. I appreciate that. Um, I would say the big reason why we do anything that we do is ultimately, whether it be as the church or as Christians individually, it's for the glory of God. Um, and based on that, I want to build for our church and for our community a universal worship culture. Um, it's important that we, with regard to worship in our local church community and how we worship God globally or outwardly in our community, our not church community, our East Atlanta Village community and elsewhere, it's important that we're all on the same page, um, that we all understand what worship is, giving glory to God and all that you do and what it isn't, just the music we play on a Sunday. Um, I want us to all understand how to worship. 
to give our, I use this phrase, sincere best to come as you are. I say sincere because you're being genuine and you're being very open and honest with where you're at and you're giving the best that you can at a given moment because God is glory of your, is worthy of your best. Um, and your best on a given day may be your absolute worst on another day. We want the sincerity of that. And I know God does as well. Um, how we make the most out of any worship experience, even if the music sucks or it's not your style. Um, so if the circumstances are bleak, how to worship through the process of grieving, through the process of acceptance, surrender, and praising in light of death, job loss, sickness, miscarriage, injustice, and heartbreak. Um, and finally, too, to nourish and fill our own hearts. Um, our hearts were created to worship God, and they were, they're made glad when they're in tune with God's purposes. So those are the nice whys of why we do, and why we worship. Um, but how, practically, what are we going to do to exercise this mission statement for worship over the coming six months and over the coming three to five years? Um, and like I said, practically, this is there's only so much I can talk about on Vision Night. And I presented to staff and to some of the elders or session leaders a bigger plan that I have. Um, and I'm happy to discuss that with any of you at length, just probably not now because we'll be here for hours. Um, but uh, this is so this is, like I said, a very 20,000 foot view. Um, so how? So to better serve God, our community and grow as a church, we'll be looking to grow our musicianship as a church. We'll be looking to increase diversity in musical styles, not the same folky type worship or indie or things like that. We'll be bringing in a lot of different things. Um, we're going to, I want to create a culture of giving, like I said, our sincere best, whatever that may be in the moment, our come as you are. Um, I want to bring about worship events and celebrations outside of our four walls and alongside our neighbor churches. That means actively collaborating with other churches in and outside of our tradition to better serve the community of East Atlanta and to use business verbiage, share best practices um, to sharpen each other, to really uh, see what's how this these different churches that may be in our tradition and not us or outside, say the local Methodist church or even the local Pentecostal church, how are they serving the community and what are they doing to engage the, the body of Christ in their community? Um, also, we plan on making modifications to our space and equipment to better optimize sound and AV quality. I'm really excited. Uh, maybe I'll know this, maybe you don't. Um, but now you know. Uh, we brought Wes McCray on. He's on the call, and I'm really excited because Wes is going to take charge in helping us. Yes, please clap. It's great. Uh, he's going to help us. Uh, <laughs> I love that, David. I saw you tap Sarah on the head. That was funny. <laughs> um, but he's going to help us d accomplish that vision. Set, uh, Wes is, I can tell Wes is really excited. Um, we did our whole interview process, Helen and I did, and Wes really stood out. I'm going to brag on you, Wes, uh, because he had, he came into it and he was very intrigued about learning how the sound worked and everything. And he was like, well, you know, I was so interested in it that I went and I did all these different ear training classes and things and all these, you know, all these things. And it, it just really blew us away with his commitment to developing not only himself, but to continuing to use his gifts to grow the church. And, um, I think that's the same kind of commitment he's going to bring to the role. So Wes, we're really excited to have you there and to have you working alongside us to make these things happen. Um, that being said, these all sound like really great things and they are, um, there's going to be a lot of changes to come and some challenges as well. Um, many of them are going to be exciting and some of them may be new or intimidating and daunting. Um, we've done many things as a church, a certain way for a very long time. And it seems to me, Village Church has grown in depth and in breadth. I'm talking about the depth of a person's spiritual life, an individual spiritual life, and in breadth uh, as a church, as our, our interweaving of lives together and as the body and the community of Christ. And it's amazing to me how that continues to grow. And you guys have done such a beautiful job of that growth over the past 10 years. And I want to leverage my background and my experiences to continue that growth and to help you guys and help us as a church. I say you guys, I mean us. Um, and if we aren't growing individually as a church and in how we serve and love our community, ultimately we're dying. Um, I always want people to see Village Church as a vibrant, creative, inspiring, 
life and hope giving part of our community, even if they don't agree with us on everything. And if we keep doing things the way that we've always done them, we will keep getting the same results. So that's, and that's not to say to downplay anything that's happened. That's to say, there's been a lot of great foundational work as we've grown at a church, but in our meetings as a staff, in our meetings with session leaders and elders, you know, we've got to change to keep growing. And like I said, some of those changes are amazing. Some are exciting. Some will be daunting and intimidating. I want to make sure that we're all communicating well through those changes. So where do we begin? And this is kind of more of the six month thing, like Matt had mentioned. It really starts with you. We, we as a church, we need your help. Um, this is officially from, from me. This is officially an open invitation to all church members interested in helping with worship. And that doesn't just mean music or, or vocals or things like that, but liturgists, sound people, video people, prayer people. Um, this includes kids. Yes. What kids? Yes. Kids. Amazing. Um, obviously things are a bit different with COVID. But has your kid been taking any kind of music lessons or are they interested in getting out? Are they are they confident in getting up and talking in front of people? I think it'd be awesome to have kid liturgists. That's something we've thrown in. Um, we've talked about I know Courtney's going to talk a lot more at length about some of these things, but we've talked about creating intentional moments in our in our liturgical worship service where we have like a kid's liturgy where the kids come up and the kids engage with that or we have songs specifically geared towards the kids and maybe have some kids up there leading. I would love that personally. Um, but there's a ton of different ways we can work together to unify our church body, not just with the adults, but get the kids and train them up too. Um, but really anybody who's interested, if your kid's been taking any kind of music lessons or express interest, or if you know they have a natural talent to talk your ears off, I know a lot of them do. Um, I want to cultivate that together. I want, those are great gifts. And obviously it's one thing I don't live with your kids. So you hear them a lot more than I do when they talk your ear off. But, and it's one thing for me to say this, but let's cultivate those gifts together. That is a good thing. That is something that was given to them by God. And I want to reinforce that. I want to make sure that we are cultivating and building those gifts up and building those kids up. Um, uh, that being said, having put out that uh, just kind of a basic, basic, as much as I can throw out in our, in our conversation here, and I know I'm running way over on time, um, uh, I, that's my official invitation. If you're interested in helping and volunteering, come talk to me, talk to Matt, Helen, one of the leaders, anyone. Um, if it's something you're confident you'd like to do, let's talk. If it's something you're unsure about, pray about it, and let's discuss your questions or concerns. I mean that wholeheartedly. If it's something where you have the skills or the means, but don't feel compelled to serve, I, I want you to be honest with yourself first, and foremost, but don't feel obligated. Um, I'm open to sit down and talk if you are. Um, I'm not out to convince you. I want to understand you. And also, if you don't necessarily have skill, but you're very interested and want to learn, I look at Wes. Like Wes may not have known anything about sound or little about it. And now he's, he's going to be our AV coordinator. That's amazing. And he's done so much just to grow because it's been of interest to him. Be encouraged by that. Uh, we want to help you and we'll work with you wherever you are to develop you in those skills. Um, we really need all hands on deck. As the body of Christ, we all have gifts meant to serve the body and we need you. Uh, if you're looking for a place to serve, but something, anything is holding you back, and that includes me, Trip, the worship director. I'd love to sit down with you and talk about it. Let's reason together. Let's let's talk about this. But all of this really kind of to bring it back full circle. I know I've thrown a lot at you guys, and I welcome questions at the end. Um, but this is all in the spirit of unifying us as a church and reconnecting and getting back together. And a lot of these things are really exciting things that are kind of until we get back in person. And a lot of what we can do right now to make the most of it is partner and work together to continue to develop the in-person services, the live feeds. I, we need volunteers to help. We need fresh faces. We need people that want to come and serve the church and serve the community. Thank you, Trip. Got to jump. In. We got to give the, we got to give the other guys let, let them uh, jump in so we still have time for question and answers. Absolutely, I'm done. Thank you. All right, David, you're up. Hello, friends. Um, I, re I really, before I just dive in, I want to pause just for a moment with you and 
acknowledge and name this moment together with you. Um, just, it's really kind of how I'm feeling and, and um, I wanna see if you, you feel the same way. I just, when I got, saw your faces on this call, <laughs> I was, I just feel the spirit of God lighting up my soul. And, and I just wanted to name that together with you for a moment. I, um, I felt that at the worship service too. This, there were six people at the worship service and it felt like there were 600. Like it just felt so deep to me. And, um, and I just feel that with you in this moment. And I wanted to acknowledge that just because I think, I mean, if we're talking about with regards to connect, I mean, I, I could talk and give you the reason why, but I, I feel it in my bones, why we connect. And I think you feel it in your bones too. We connect because we feel the spirit of God lighting us up because that's actually what happens when we connect the spirit of God is present with us. I mean, you know, the classic verse, Jesus is, you know, where two or three are gathered in his name. He is there with them. And I, I have felt that in a new way that I've never felt that before in, even in the last week or two. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. I mean, I, you know, I, I love that about the Christian life that, I can have there. There are so many layers to like. I, I can. I know that verse, but like I can experience it in a new way um, during a new season of life, and um, that's just so beautiful to me. About that's what's so beautiful to me about the Christian life, and that's what's so beautiful to me about community, is that uh, is that God is present in the midst of it, and I feel it. And, and my prayer is that we would all all feel that the, the spirit of God lighting up our souls um, as we connect. And I, and I think I believe that that happens when any two of you or when when I meet with one of you or when two of you meet together, when any of us meet together to connect. Um, God is present there by the power of his spirit to light us up. And um, and I feel that. And so. I just wanted to acknowledge that I, I can't, I, I am so hopeful um, for even just returning to worship and returning to uh, more and more connection in the life of our church. And I, it just, it, it really, really ignites my soul uh, to think about this. So um, having said that, I want to um, just dive into, uh, to talk through uh, a few points and, um, so track with me, I, you know, did, we're recasting this vision um, as Matt and Trip have done. And, and that's just it, you know, we're with Connect, we're, we're, um, we're called to connect together to form relationships with God and one another. And, uh, and, and the reason we connect is because God is present in community. And, uh, and when we don't have community, we, we can't grow. Um, we need community, we need one another. Um, and so, uh, that's why, why we do it is because God is present and powerful in the midst of, of community. And we know that in our bones, we've missed that. And I'm hopeful uh, for uh, the, the reconnection that, that has begun to happen and that is uh, gonna happen even more. Um, so I just wanna take uh, the next few moments to um, talk through kind of some of the transition that's happening um, with uh, the way we've done community. Um, as many of you uh, know, and I think many of you have been a part of a village group at some point, um, or that, or you have or have or were a part of a village group uh, last year um, before uh, the pandemic hit, and uh, so we had to. So we were already on a, a transition plan before the pandemic hit uh, to move from. Uh, or to, to create a more sustainable structure uh, for um, for our our life together as a community, and you've heard this sort of these term this term thrown around of parishes, and I want to talk about that a little bit. I'm not going to be able to talk about it in full today, but I do want to uh, talk about it a little abstractly, um, and then we're going to continue to roll that out over the next several months. Um, so we were, I mean, the goal uh, was, you know, we were, you know. 
village groups were in full force uh, when when COVID hit, and we uh, those those groups were not meeting in person. And uh, as of March and April, a lot of those groups began uh, meeting virtually. And so we over the summer uh, had to come up with uh, sort of a creative solution uh, during the pandemic for what to do. Uh, uh, you know, in regards to this this challenge of how do we connect during the pandemic? And, uh, you know, Matt began talking about Jeremiah 29 and how do we build houses uh, during uh, exile. And we, we came up with this creative solution to do house groups, which we've been communicating about over email. And we've also been communicating about on during our worship services. Um, and so house groups, um, just so you know, so um, they are a creative solution uh, during the pandemic, but also they're serving as this interim step for us as we move towards neighborhood parishes. Um, so I'm really excited because a lot of you uh, have emailed me. Uh, I've had a lot of people uh, respond to the survey. And right now we uh, just wanted to take a minute to celebrate. We have 10 house groups that are, that are formed and beginning to meet. And I am, I'm super excited about that. Um, and most of those are primarily located um, in uh, in your neighborhoods, and so in neighborhoods that are um, uh, they're, they're formed by neighborhood. Um, so the purpose of those groups are twofold: to meet uh, for worship, to meet to uh, together to watch the worship service, uh, and then also to meet together during the week if the group chooses. For Bible study, uh, the Bible study content I'm going to be providing for that. I'm going to be. I just recorded the first one, the first uh, uh, devotional. I'm going to be producing uh, these five-minute devotionals on a new YouTube channel. Never thought I would have a YouTube channel. Um, by the way, my daughter just got a YouTube channel, uh, and I'm competing with her. So um, watch out. Anyways. Uh, so, uh, so the purpose is, so again, the purpose is to meet together for, to watch the worship service and then also to meet together for this Bible study. We're going to be going through the Psalms of Ascent using Eugene Peterson's um, uh, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. I've, I've read through that and he actually preached through it as well. And I've, I just love it. And I think it's really timely for us. So uh, that's the content I'm going to be providing on a weekly basis uh, for our house groups. So where are we going? Um, we're moving towards uh, a more sustainable structure uh, that we can look to that would, would help us to continue to build community for the next three, five, 10 years. And this is where we're beginning to talk about and beginning to, to transition towards neighborhood parishes. Um, again, we just, we, the need is that we have structure that enables us to connect in relationships. Um, so just a, just a brief definition of what is a parish. A parish um, is a large group of people, uh, 15 people. It could be as minimum as 15 people, upwards to 40 people, including children, who live in the same geographical area and who connect together by doing, by doing life together. By um, That's kind of the, the best way to sort of, kind of uh, to talk about it is they we do life together by they, they study the Bible together they pray together they eat together they serve together um, fill in the blank they do life together and so they do it together for the sake of um, living out their you know their mission together for this for the glory of God and for the the good of their neighbor so what we've begun doing is uh, we've we've created, three neighborhood parishes um, already. We've, we've broken out three neighborhood parishes, um, and I can talk more about that um, later. Um, but what, what we're doing is we've, uh, we're forming leadership teams uh, within these parishes, and these leadership teams will, will begin meeting by late fall. And so our hope is that once these leadership teams are in place, uh, we'll begin rolling this out even as early as um, uh, late winter, early spring of next year. 
So um, what's your, how can you um, be a part of this? How can, you know, really the action step for you is to get connected. I'd say get connected to a house group, if at all possible. Um, uh, these house groups, again, are this interim step to, for us to move towards, uh, to move towards the parishes. And so get connected to a house group. I haven't even mentioned yet about our uh, transition with our women's ministry. Um, again, I'm thankful so much for, for Megan and, um, and her team that did such a great job. And, and Angela Floyd has come in and, and is doing a great job with uh, forming her uh, team around her. And there's all sorts of initiatives happening with walk and talks and with, um, with Bible studies. And, uh, and we had a great men's ministry event. Uh, Joel organized uh, last week uh, where we some guys got together at Brownwood Park for the time to reconnect. So there's a lot of great things happening. Um, so um, get connected, whether it be in one of those uh, women's ministry events or, or whether it be with a house group. Um, but I'm trying to keep to my time here, so I'm going to uh, cut it off. Thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Courtney, we are, yeah, we are tight on time, so um, yeah. <laughs> you are up. Sorry, guys. Take it. These gentlemen take my time up. It's fine. It's fine. We'll, we'll catch it up. Um, Courtney here. I miss you all. Um, I started my role in children's discipleship uh, in the holidays, around the holiday time period last year. And um, then two or three months later, uh, a worldwide pandemic hit. So we're going to file that under the strangest job transition ever. <laughs> um, but Matt and I are uh, fumbling our way along. And uh, one of the things that was helpful is right before the pandemic hit, I did go to um, a conference that the PCA put on and picked up this book, Sustainable Children's Ministry from Last Minute Scrambling to Long-Term Solutions. And that felt like solid ground for a moment um, this summer. And so Matt and I um, spent the summer reading that and talking about where we wanna take um, children's discipleship. And one of the big picture realizations that we made um, by reading that book um, was actually an issue of identity um, about the way my department is named um, by calling uh, the children's by calling it the children's discipleship department. Um, unfortunately, that does mean that we tend to focus our energies on children who are newborn up through about age 11. Um, and it's hard just from a literally an identity standpoint to think beyond that. Um, and it misses the ministries, the very critical ministry, ministries that we need to be doing. Um, and there are four of them that come to mind, um, which is ministry to our middle schoolers, uh, ministry for and with our high schoolers. Um, we want to be doing ministry to uh, families uh, who want to engage in the adoption process. Um, as well as ministry to just our parents in general who might want to engage in uh, marriage retreats or retreats or lessons on parenting and stuff like that. So um, the first thing that we are planning on doing for my department is just literally changing the name and calling it the Department of Family Discipleship. And for me, it just is more comforting to um, have a kind of broader name that helps me understand how to lay things out and how to move forward as a department. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, as important as all that is, and I do plan on sending a follow-up email um, next week to all the families and to the membership in general so that you understand where we're heading in the big picture, um, that does not address what is needed for families right now on Sunday mornings when you are um, trying to worship in your homes with your children, which I can attest is extremely difficult. <laughs> um, so how am I addressing that and how do we address worshiping with our children during a worldwide pandemic? The big true answer is I, honest to God, do not know. <laughs> I do not know how to do this. This is our first pandemic. Um, and hopefully my last, but I am really, really, really grateful that the Lord is just um, giving me step by step how to move forward. And last week it was incredibly clear. He's um, just kind of made it clear to me that we need to be 
figuring out what we're doing on Sunday mornings with our kids. So in November, the hope is to, along with my family discipleship team that has just recently started to form um, and is starting to meet to figure out how we wrap our arms around the families of our church, um, we are hoping in November to take the first 20 to 30 minutes just prior to adult worship starting to um, have a time of, it will either be a lesson or a Zoom call with the, um, it'll either be a pre-recorded video lesson or a Zoom call with um, your children's previous Sunday school teacher. And the hope is um, twofold. Obviously, we want an opportunity for the kids when they're, when they're fresh um, and are ready to start uh, morning church, um, that they would have an opportunity to have a moment that's intended just for them. Um, and that they would have a small lesson that they could engage with um, as well as connect with both the other students in some way um, and their previous teachers who have loved them so well during the year and have frankly missed them um, as we've had to take this break for the pandemic. So that is coming your way. I ask that you please um, stay uh, connected to your email because as that forms, we'll be sending out information. Um, I also mentioned my family discipleship uh, advisory team that is forming and we have agreed that the first order of business um, is to really build out a pandemic care plan um, for our families. This is incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult for families with young children. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're serving you well. So another thing that I really need you to have your eye out for is for a survey that will be coming your way soon that asks a variety of questions of how we can best be serving you during this time. Because um, if we don't know the issues that you're engaging with or the ways in which we can serve you best, we don't know how to serve you best and we'll just be kind of shooting in the dark. So please respond to that survey if you do nothing else. Um, so um, I want to keep this short and those are just like the real, like there's a big picture family discipleship name change that I'm super excited about um, because it helps me kind of figure out where I'm heading and then just want you to know that we are working on a pandemic care plan. Um, so keep an ear out if you have previously been involved um, volunteering in children's discipleship, um, we might be calling on you um, as well as if you have, Little kids will be letting you know the details of that. And just a final, um, just kind of a pastoral word that I just feel compelled um, to share with you. I just know that this is really, really hard. It's very, very difficult for Andy and I um, and our kids and our pod of friends who are trying to um, educate our kids and, and stay sane. And I just want you to know I love you and um, it's going to be okay. And um, just also share that um, sometimes in the more I like I'm just so hopeful for our, our church and for the families in our church. Sometimes I, I do wake up in the morning and as difficult as this is, I actually sometimes think God stopped our world because he loves us too much to let us continue in either bad patterns that needed to be shaken up or he and also he loves people out in the world right now who do not know him too much to not stop the world with the pandemic and say, let's get engaged. So um, I am actually really, really excited as difficult and as exhausting this is, I'm really excited and am just hopeful to partner with the Lord and move forward alongside you. So that's my family discipleship up to you. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you so much. Um, all right. <clears throat> so, uh, because we are running late on time, I want to give uh, people an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I've got a couple, but I want you to, to anyone who wants to, if you look in the chat, uh, you should see <clears throat> a message there that has a telephone number to send a question to. Um, I've got two questions so far, so not many. Um, the first one is, would you consider <clears throat> doing a safe in-person communion for families that still need to be virtual? And, <clears throat> excuse me. and the answer is yes, we are actively discussing that. We were excited to have communion on Sunday. I thought David Stansel was going to, I thought his head was going to pop off. He was so excited. Um, I was also excited, but uh, it was great to have it. Um, 
and that we've we've been having conversations. We we don't have a formal plan. We're talking about uh, the possibility of virtual communion. If this is a potential dispensation where we can allow families to do communion at home with us, um, or a drive-through type of communion, which is more what this question sounds like, considering doing a safe in-person communion. So the answer is yes, we have not been able to, we've not worked out the final details on that. All right, uh, another question is, um, let's see. How, Trip? this question is related to you, how will these awesome worship ideas be accomplished? What is the timeline and funding plan to do this cultivation? That is a great question. And I, I love that question. Um, <laughs> let me let me pull my notes back up because I'm the one who, who cursed us on time. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so I've got these big plans. And David and I have this ongoing debate or, dis, or rather this battle in staff of who's the lesser administratively minded person. And it's me. But and David, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I've got a lot of plans and I've got this this a lot of these different things. I talked about a few of them uh, and I'm really working on right now. What is most immediate, most necessary, most needed? Um, so as far as the timeline goes, this is a great plug for y'all's help. So this is also another open invitation. Um, if you care deeply about worship at Villas Church, if you're willing to be constructive, but help build us. Um, I'm working on putting together an advisory team like Courtney's taught about hers. Um, pray about being a part of that. Uh, I'm one guy, but like anybody else, I've got these blind spots. I can come up with great plans, but I need people to help me kind of work around. Okay, well, based on this, you know, we need to go that way or this, that, the other. Um, I don't have it all together. I've got my own biases. I've got my own experience, but I also have my own blind spots. Um, to answer that question, um, Right now, we're focused on utilizing the resources that we have in the church, um, whether that's the people. That's why I put a big emphasis on if, if you're interested in any capacity in serving, please talk to us. We need your help. Um, as far as the audiovisual stuff, um, there's a lot of great things planned for that. And um, we are going to, obviously, we're coming to the end of this year from a budget perspective. I, I don't want to take up all the time. From a budget perspective, those are things we need to prioritize, the things we need to establish. Okay, well, I know we want to make sound improvements in the room. We want to add different instruments. We want to bring in these different features from an audio standpoint. Um, but those are things that we need to look at our budget and prioritize. Those aren't answers that I have right now. Um, but whoever you are, I'm glad that you asked this question. And these are things that we're definitely you know, discussing and talking about outside of this. Thank you, Trip. Yep. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked, um, we've, we've mentioned interest in joining house groups in the survey. Can you clarify how we join a house group? Um, the, the best way to join a house group is to text David Stansel. And his email is david at villagechurchofeastatlanta.org. Oh, email. Did I say? Yeah. You said text. Yeah. Sorry. Email, David. I don't think texting that would work. Nope. But yes, please email me. I'm happy to connect you. Um, absolutely. Uh, yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is David Stansel now considered a YouTube influencer? <laughs> um, question. I'd, like, I'd like to think so. Um, I mean, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm going to say no. Um, all right. We had one question about the parishes. Um, uh, just a question about what we, I think we, you said, David, that that, that process slowed down, the, the process of implementing the parishes. And someone's just curious, why? Is it logistics? Is it some other? They, just, they said specifics would help understanding why, why the parish rollout is slowing down. Um, actually it's not, well, it's not really, did I say slowing down? If I did, I, it's actually not slowing down. It's, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, uh, content with where it is because we are forming these leadership teams and the goal is to get these leadership teams in place, uh, before we roll it out. So that's, uh, that's been the big piece this fall. Um, and, and the house groups are, are again, a, a piece of, of the puzzle there to, to 
enable the parishes to begin um, uh, to begin. So w- when we come to the spring, you know, there's a lot of pieces that will already be there. Um, so it'll be an easy rollout. Um, so I, I guess I didn't, if I said I was, it was slowed down, I didn't mean to say it slowed down. It was just part of the transition. I mean, the, uh, Can I add something to that? Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank well, you. I, I'd say our, our plans in February called for this, the, the parish model to, to be kicked off with large group meetings. Uh, and that, and, and, and the sort of the, the plan that we had a written plan in place before March, that those plans, a lot of those plans depended on in-person meetings. Um, so when we were sort of scrambling there in March, April, May, that stuff did get, we pause was pushed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and everything, yeah. everything in the church slowed down between March and June and July, to be honest. So yes, things did slow down. A lot of it was COVID related and not knowing what we could or couldn't do. Hey guys, I have some questions about this and I did have to step away, so maybe you answered them. Uh Uh, But I guess one question I have is like, how are you equipping the leaders and are the leaders uh, identified already um, for the parish groups? And then how does it relate to village groups too? Yeah, so can I answer that, Matt? Yeah. So to your first question, um, so the elders and um, and and the staffs uh, got together. I say the el- mainly the elders got together to identify uh, the the leaders, and the leaders are not going to be elders or deacons. Um, they're going to be other lay leaders. So they're not going to be any any existing or uh, um, deacons or elders, but they were other people that were identified who and they. The, we we kind of had fun naming them because we we uh, we went between like special ops and special forces. So like this is a group of special forces, if you will. And what I mean by that, it's like um, we tried to gather together a group of people who had a mix of gifts. So the purpose of these leadership teams is they, again, the big idea is that uh, parishes do life together. And so the leadership teams kind of make that life together happen in the church. And they make that life together happen through these five areas of ministry that we talked about, worship, connect, grow, serve, and share. And so these leadership teams are going to help uh, make that happen. So they help uh, make that, they help organize the life together to make that happen. But it's not just that, they're also helping provide the spiritual care, the pastoral care. That's where our, our shepherding model has changed. So we'll, for example, let's take, um, if you don't, I'm going to push this into the concrete a little bit. So let's take uh, one of the parishes that we have is Ormwood Park Grant Park. And Lee Kynes is the elder in that. So Lee Kynes before had a group of uh, people on his, that were like a group of, I don't even know, 40 people that he had, like he was a responsible for shepherding. And then he also had his village group. And that really was not a very sustainable way of doing shepherding because he felt pulled in the direction of his village group. And he felt, I'm picking on you, Lee, if that's all right. And he, um, and, and I, I think he also wanted to do, you know, of course he felt responsible uh, to shepherd the people in his, in his shepherding group. And so the goal of is now like Lee will, Lee will be responsible for all of the people on the roster in Ormwood Park Grant Park. But what his role is, is to invest in the leadership team. Like his primary role is to invest in those leaders. And then they are the ones that are doing the primary kind of spiritual care, if you will. Ultimately, at least still responsible at the end of the day for those for those people, because he's the elder. But the way in which we're, do, we're doing shepherding is he's, he's focused on investing in the, that leadership team. And so um, I'm going to try to answer your second question and then we can, you can follow up with me, but you said village groups. So village groups, uh, we, the, we, we never wanted to really, we wanted to allow village groups to continue to meet and to continue to, to meet together for Bible study. The parishes were a, were a structure that we were building over the village groups, if you will, to, to kind of create more sustainability and then over time, you know, the village groups would evolve. Um, so village groups have the freedom to meet 
you know, say there's a village group that has different people. I know there are village groups even now that have different people from different neighborhoods and they, they meet together. That's totally great. We would, we continue to encourage that in addition to kind of the way in which we're moving forward to create community over the next three to five years, which is these parishes. So it's both and um, village groups can continue to meet uh, and we encourage that, but we're, we built this structure, this, this larger structure of parishes uh, to help create more sustainability around that. So um, let me ju- let me jump in a little bit there. So it's we're, we're seeking to create a tiered leadership structure. So elders oversee parishes and oversee the parish leaders. The parish leaders oversee the groups within that parish. That would include village groups. That would include uh, men's and women's groups. Those would include maybe service groups or, you know, within the parish model, there's a, there's a greater diversity of types of groups that can be formed. So the village group leaders, you know, oversee the people in their group. And so it's a way of each leader has less people to kind of keep an eye on. So it's more sustainable. That's, that's ultimately where we want to get. Does that make sense? Sarah? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, there are still some things that are a little fuzzy to me, but I think maybe that's because you guys haven't fully rolled them out yet. Like, I mean, how are you, you said you went through a process and identified parish leaders. Are parish leaders men? Are they mixed gender? What? How is that? Oh, oh they're mixed gender. They're definitely men, men and women for sure. Yeah, men and women for sure. And um, again, we're trying to create a diversity of gift, like a mix of gifts on the team. So it's not just like they're all shepherds, you know, like we want to have different people doing different things. So, and, and part of the, the strength of the, this, 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 um, the parish model is, it's this shared leadership model where as opposed to, I think, um, you know, if again, that we're trying to create more sustainability. So, uh, it, it allows, for, for that sustainability to happen rather than just sort of that one leader feeling the responsibility to do everything. Like the one village group leader say, they've got to organize, they've got to lead the Bible study, they've got to host, you know. And so that can feel a lot for a parish leader or a host, or sorry, for a village group leader or a host. So we wanted to um, create a, these leadership teams where there's shared responsibility and there's a mix of gifts. And last question, I promise. No, 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 no. this is great. This is great. The, the last question I have just is the the rationale for the geographic um, alignment because there are, are some groups that have been pretty established and I just want to have a better understanding of of why I guess why geography or why the actual why uh, yeah, I, I understand the tiered structure really well I just want to understand the geography yeah well that the nature of, like the definition of a parish is it's geographical like um, that's just that's what a parish is by nature it's it's formed like it's i mean the best example is is the roman catholic church you know they they divide it they when they came into even like new york city they went in and they they said you know we're going to divide up the the whole city by parishes based on geography and so um let let me jump in there i think the question is you know why are we thinking geographically and really the reason is we, we've been uh, wrestling with assimilation, uh, which is how do we help people plug in? And, and one of the reasons we le- lean towards geography is it's, uh, we want to connect people with those who are closest to them to, because we do think geography matters. And so that's, I think that's what David meant before. Like if, you're, if you love your village group and you technically live in this parish and not that parish, like go to that village group. It's totally fine. But moving forward, we think trying to connect people who are geographically close makes that connection easier. That's the that's the reason we're thinking geographically. Yeah, and just uh, to speak to the assimilation, it like so say the visitor walks in the church instead of trying to figure out what day they're available to meet and who like just there's all these sort of like you know the flow chart of trying to go through like trying to connect them. This actually solves it immediately where we just say, hey, where do you live? And then there's an immediate connection to say, oh, I live in, you know, East Lake. Uh, so, oh, we have a we have a parish there. I'm gonna, you know, can I connect you up? And uh, and we would immediately connect them to. That doesn't mean they can't be connected to other groups in the in the church. For sure, they can. 
there's total freedom to be connected to other. It's just the, it's just one of the ways in which we're primarily trying to assimilate people and do community together. There's going to be groups in the church that overlap and, you know, overlap parishes. Um, but it's just a, a way to, to primarily do uh, community together. Thanks guys. Thank you. All right. A couple more questions here. When are we moving to phase two in-person worship? Great question. Um, I just, I think that, I don't know if the email went out today, but I, I, I concluded something in the newsletter. Phase uh, one on mo- Sunday was great. Went really well. All thanks, well, besides God, it goes to Helen and uh, Helen Kynes and Rob Fortson, and they did a great job. We we are encouraged and we're, we're excited to move to phase two, but because of staffing and volunteer availability, we're actually going to have one more week of phase one. So limited to 10 people in the worshipers in the service. And our plan, again, as long as everything continues to go well this Sunday, our plan is to go to phase two, which is 25 total you know, additional worshipers uh, next Sunday. So in two Sundays. Next question, what's going on with the building itself? Are we renewing the lease or shopping for a new place? Um, we are, um, we did, <laughs> I think in February or March, we formed a real estate team. Lee, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, I mean, it, we, we were going to start shopping <laughs> and now we're not. Uh, but that's not to say we may not start again. So our lease is up in uh, three, we have three more years on our lease. Um, so we do have some time and our landlord has been awesome. Uh, he's been awesome the whole time we've been there and he continues to be awesome. Um, frankly, I don't know that we know what our space needs are uh, anymore. Um, and so what we thought six months ago may not be the same six months from now. So I think uh, we, you know, at some point we'll pick back up with this process, but right now it's the wisest course is just to kind of stay the course and see what happens. Thank you, Lee. Um, Those are all the questions I think that I've gotten and we're right, we're right at time. Uh, But if anyone does have another question, We have time for maybe one more. I also wanted to just say one thing. Um, I'm just, I just broke the law. Um, I was the one who texted you, Matt, about the in phase two. (laughs) I wanted you to announce it. Um, I want to say that like, you know, having a, a virtual meeting like this is so, it just seems so impersonal and whatever. And I feel like, sometimes it might be difficult to speak up and ask a question. And so our follow-up, I'm just going to go ahead and follow up with you guys now, which is please email us if you have a concern about anything that was said today, um, tonight, um, or any other concern. And if you had a question and that you wanted to answer, but I mean, I'm not answer, but wanted to ask, but just feel like you had the courage to, you can also you can email info at villagechurchofeastatlanta.com. So um, I just want to put that out there and encourage you to, to reach out and ask questions. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's .org, right? Not .com. .org. .org. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you for your questions, staff. Thank you for your presentation. Um, the Lord is with us, and we're thankful. Lee, would you close us in prayer? Yes, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we could never have predicted uh, that we'd be sitting in a a Zoom call in the middle of a pandemic. Um, But you knew, Lord. You knew from the beginning of time that that we would be in this place, uh, that we, your people, would uh, would be put in a tough spot. Um, And your people have been put in tough spots before. You've put your people in tough spots before. Uh, for your glory and for our good. So so we claim that, Lord. We claim um, the history of your love, and we claim the the reality of your love in the present, Lord. Um, We ask, Lord, that you would, your spirit would move in us, uh, and that you would use this season, again, for for your glory and for our good. Um, We trust that you are at work 
Lord. Uh, we trust that you're at work and we trust that you're present. Um, Lord, even though we are all separated right now, you are present here with us. Um, somehow mysteriously on this call, you are present here with us. And so, Lord, we are grateful for that. And that that is the place we want to be. Uh, Lord, we do uh, pray for uh, the ministries of this church. Uh, Lord, you are at work building your kingdom in this place, um, whether we do it or not. And we humbly um, submit ourselves to your service, Lord, uh, to do your work here in this place. And we pray for connection. We pray that you would teach us to worship. We pray that you would teach us to love each other um, more fully and to love you more fully. Uh, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye, friends. Bye, everyone. Bye, Thank friends. you. Good night. Thank you. Feel free to say bye before you go. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Dan, David. Bye. Bye. Andy. <laughs> bye, Christina. Bye, bye. Bye, Dad. Oh, now I see Matt Altmix. I think he's gone. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. <laughs>